doing it. You got you supposed to be happy you sitting there with Kid L. Why you mad? The Kid L podcast. Rolling? Rocking and rolling. All Star Lee What's is up, in bro? the building, man. What's happening, bro? What's that word? What you know we met. Doing? Like a few years ago, right? At the club. Yeah. Yeah, I remember that. I jumped on top of the table. I told you, though. Yeah. I said, get up here with me, nigga. Yeah, we went I crazy. You, yeah. The VIP booth, and we just went nuts. Mm-hmm. Uh, I I realized at that point uh, that your energy got you where you are in the rap scene. For sure. Because that stuff can be faked on social media a little bit, but once people figure it out, they fade away from you. But you, your energy in real life is just like how it is in your music and everything For you sure. put out. Before we start, I got to tell you guys about the hottest wing spot in Detroit, Mighty Wing Shop. Last weekend, I ordered a pound of wings and an incredible order of chicken and waffles. Guys, it's beyond this world. They also serve breakfast, pita wraps, quesadillas, and more. Located at 20131 Greenfield, Detroit. Go check out the Mighty Wing Shop. Uh, first time deal. I heard of you was probably Fresh Prince um, When that dropped I was like okay what's happening mm-hmm. And then unfortunately I heard about your name Through other sites of ways of people trying to Call your name out and all these types of things that were happening Where I was like mm-hmm. okay this dude's really Really emerging in the scene mm-hmm. um, A lot of things are happening but now when we come to recent times um, Things are a little bit Different uh, Your your shift has uh, changed a little bit Your music has changed a little bit mm-hmm. Um, where do you think right now you are as far as your music career is concerned? Do you feel like um, you're at where you want to be? Do you feel like you're getting the recognition you deserve from what you've accomplished already? Or do you feel like everything has to be a reset at one point? To be honest with you, bro, it always can be better. You know what I'm saying? I appreciate the people who support me, though, you know. But I know I could be better. I'd have been called a legend, you know what I'm saying, by certain people. And, you know, I don't never down myself. I'm a confident nigga, but... I also feel like I got a lot more to do to be like legendary status. But I've been I've been in the city on the scene since I was seventeen too though at the same time. Like solid holding this shit down. Like, you know what I'm saying? Hitting milestones. For sure. So, you know, I just feel like do I get what I deserve? Yeah, I'm one of them niggas. I'm gonna keep it real. I know I could work harder. I know I could do more shit. So I ain't about to just sit up here and be like, No, I deserve more to what I ain't one of them kind of niggas. I, I know what it take now, you know what I'm saying? I had to learn the business. So I just feel like I'm where I, you know what I'm saying. I, I I definitely want more, but my supporters feel I'm at a certain level, and I'm gonna just keep on, you know, feeding the people that support me for the most part. You know what I'm saying? Oh yeah, no, yeah, that's the 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 best way to go out about it. It's like you're not sour about anything. You just realize yeah, like not. it's just about the grind, and the grind always continues. That's right? all it's about, bro. Uh, you've been a part of uh, prolific groups that have accomplished major things in the city, man. And I want to get into all that, but yeah. I like to start with day zero with everybody. I like to start from chapter one, man. Uh, where you were born. Yeah, and uh, what it was like growing up in the area you were from? Shit, I'm from the west side of Detroit. I'm from Six Mile. You know what I'm saying? We call it Brick Mile, though. You know what I'm saying? A lot of people might know it from T shit, but that's our part. You know what I'm saying? Between Evergreen and Telegraph, Lanfear Block is on my neck. You know what I'm saying? That's where I'm from. So, really, Six Mile to Bright Mile. So, what it is is on Lanfear, the first block of Lanfear, that's Six Mile. Then when you pass Pilgrim, that's Bright Mile. It's like we real neighbors. You know, Bright Mile kind of big though, but. Once you pass that sad street on Lanfear, that's literally Brightmo. So we had the spot in Brightmo, and I stayed on Six Mile because it's only a block away. I went to school on Ho- at uh, at the school called Houghton in like uh, elementary school and shit like that. So I'm from the West Side. I'm from Six Mile, bro. You know what I'm saying? So you're growing up um, in the city and everything like that. What's yeah. your experiences like? Um, what leads you into getting into music in the first place? I'm gonna be honest, like. My hood, you know, a lot of hoods in Detroit was treacherous, so I ain't going to just sit here and act like, but, you know, it was treacherous growing up, but I had a lot of OGs. I had big brothers. I always had my daddy in my life. My daddy was a young parent. You know what I'm saying? My mom and daddy was young parents, so I seen a lot coming up. You know what I'm saying? But music has always been in my household. You know, shout out my daddy, Bo Skeet. He used to rap, so a lot of the hood used to bang his shit. I used to hear his shit. We was heavy on cash, money, you know what I'm saying, Mob Deep, all that shit. East Coast, West Coast, South Music. That's why I'm so much of a great rapper, just because it was like a it was like a pot of gumbo. It was a mixture. You know what I'm saying? My household, it was always music. We we grew up boxing. My old dude loved boxing, so of course our hands, A1. You know what I'm saying? We used to get the gloves, everybody going to outside in the front. Niggas throw their hands. If you if y'all playing the game and y'all feel some type of way, we gonna see what you really about tossing the gloves get out here in the middle of the street let's see what you you know and we the type of niggas we gonna teach you how to fight if you don't know how to fight you get out there you got the heart my old dude love that boxing shit so i grew up boxing too a lot of they they thought i was really gonna box because at the age of like five or six years old i was throwing combos like some shit that went viral right now i was doing that just because how infatuated my daddy is with boxing 
You know what I'm saying? So he taught yeah. me a lot of that. So as me growing up, it was just it was fun times, and then of course it was it was treacherous times, just like any other any other trenches. You know what I'm uh, saying? Was there a moment where uh, something happened so significant that it sparks your awareness that you're alive and that like shit's real? Like, is there any particular of thing? Of course, that you- bro. Like, <clears throat> I've been going through traumatic situations since I was a kid, bro. Gunfire, hearing gunshots, house getting shot through. You know what I'm saying? Crib getting shot up, raids. All that at a young age, six to seven years old. And what be so fucked up is, you know, growing up where we from, we look at that shit like it's normal. When really in reality it's not. You know what I'm saying? Shit, no kids really had to go through that. But that's just how it was in my hood. Yeah, I have a lot of friends that talk about that. They said that it wasn't until they were like 20 or 22 that they realized the things they were seeing weren't normal. Like not every single kid is supposed to see a body or anything like that. Yeah, you got to see the world, man. Like once you get to experience it, you touch you a couple dollars. And you get to, you know, experiencing different shit, getting richer friends and stuff like that. You realize your upbringing was fucked up because they don't even know what you're talking about. They never even seen nothing or even know the the traumatic experiences of not eating and all that shit. They, they ain't go through that. You know what I'm saying? So, yeah. hell yeah, you realize at a certain point in your life if you get there. You know what I'm saying? I'm um, continuing from that point uh, as you're growing up and watching these things happen, but... Um, realizing that boxing is something you're good at um, mm-hmm. and everything like that. Did you kind of stay on a straight and narrow path from that point? Or, like, how did your trajectory kind of go? I mean, I ain't about to sit here and, and just act like I was a horrible kid because my parents and them, they, they always wanted me to do the, the right shit, even though my daddy was in the streets, my granddaddy was in the streets, my great uncle was in the streets. They always wanted me to do better. But look at what I'm seeing. You know what I'm saying? Y'all telling me this, but I'm seeing this. You know what I'm saying? So the boxing was cool, but it's just like, it was just in me, bro. Like, ever since I can remember, bro, I've been infatuated with, like, jewelry and money, cars, music, just the lifestyle. You know what I'm saying? I've always loved that. Like, I didn't even watch cartoons, bro. I used to jump on the bed and watch 106 in Park, bro. Mm. You can ask my, and they telling me this. Like, you know what I'm saying? I've been rapping since four, five, six years old. Word for word shit, and I don't even know what it mean, but I'm infatuated with music and the lifestyle. Yeah. Not only because I see it on the TV, but I'm seeing it in my world at the same time. My uncles got jewelry. You know what I'm saying? They they pulling up in cars on rims and shit like that. So that's the type of shit that I always knew that I was going to be into. You know what I'm saying? What I was, was molded that way, I would say. What was the first point where you actually um, stepped into a booth and realized, like, okay, this is actually working for me? I got in, First time I got in the booth, I had to be in, like... The eighth grade, I had to be like thirteen. Me and my homie and them, um, his cousin, his older cousin, had a studio and shit. And I'm like, I could rap. You know what I'm saying? I always used to freestyle at the lunch tables in sixth grade. We used to do the wild style, like wild and out. We did that shit in sixth grade. I'm I'm roast flaming niggas rapping on their ass. You know what I'm saying? So then it turned into me just rapping about the shit that I was going through or seeing. Like eighth grade, I think. Yeah, eighth grade was like the first time I got in the studio. I was about thirteen. You remember who it was? The producer or engineer? Nah, I don't remember who Damn, it was. Damn, how do you not remember your first engineer, man? That's fucking uh, crazy. I remember the first person that ever did anything for me. Nah, I don't remember. But I, I could tell you when I when I met my nigga Poe, shout out my brother Campaign. When oh, I was yeah. 15, we, we used to fuck with Street G's and them and Inkster. Okay. That was like, because see, what it was when I was 13, I was in the studio. We did, I got on like seven songs. And then for that year, that when I was like 14, I ain't get in the studio no more after that. Then when I was 15, I met Poe and them. We started getting back in the studio. So shout out to my Street G niggas. We used to use their studio. They used to, you know, have beats and, you know, let us do our thing, that motherfucker. So shout out to them. Sure. Is this kind of a roughly around same era as, like, Stunt Hard or in Band Gang? Or is this a little bit earlier? Yes, it's, it's earlier. Cause, okay. Because I would say we was a part of that with, with Stunt Hard and Band okay. Gang. You know what I'm saying? What's that, like, 2014? Yeah, well, like All Star Ball Hard is a little bit earlier. Yeah, right? we 2012, 2013. So yeah. we was around, like, we was, like, right up under the Dope Boys and Team Me set. Okay, You know cool. what I'm saying? Because they older than us. So so there, it was kind of during their exit and then during the new wave coming out. It was about, I wouldn't say they exit because them niggas was going crazy. You but, know what I'm saying? Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. More so but like, no, they're like, yeah. the younger generation for sure was this. For yeah. sure. I feel like it sounds from what I'm hearing from people is that 2014 was kind of the new wave. Like that's when Doughboys and Team Eastside Like they're still banging Everybody individually is banging But yeah, as far but as it was groups, new acts coming Yeah, yeah Everything yeah, new for was sure. coming I would say that too Okay for sure And too. so uh, talk about That beginning process um, You were independent as first Where you just like Solidified as yourself So uh, When we first Really was like In like 2013 We had DSO with Street G's They from Inkster They were some real niggas Big homies Shout out my nigga Bucks And them um, Po Boy Adano They had kind of took us Under their wing They was rapping They kind of knew more of the business 
we 17, me, T, Po, we 17, 18. So them niggas took us up under their wing, got us shows, kept us in the studio, paid for studio time, shit like that. So that was kind of like a like a homie deal. We wasn't in no contract, but it was like, you know, we fucking with this. I, we were actually too young to sign contracts. How old are you guys? We were 17 at the time. Okay, right. So you had to be 18 or older to sign a contract or have your parents sign it. So we weren't even old enough to sign no contracts. Was it pretty much a contract without a contract, like as far as returning money and all that stuff? Or? That's a fact. Okay, so a fact. we kind of had just an agreement, and they seen the talent. And as we was young niggas in the streets, we didn't know we didn't know nothing about the business. We was already spending our own money though when we was sixteen, fifteen. Though how much did they front you guys? Well, I wouldn't even say they fronted us nothing. They just paid for the, like the ice, the studio time, and shit like that. Like shit, we cool. needed videos and shit like that. But they spent a couple dollars on us though. For but sure, we, we we was young niggas that we'd go get some money though. However, we had to go get it. We gonna go get some money. Talk you know about the, that beginning process, though. You guys are getting, um, you guys are have pretty much investors, people who are willing to invest in you and be part of the ride with you. Mm-hmm. Um, talk about, continue from that point. Shit, from that point, bro, uh, we started really, once once our situation with Street G's kind of expired, which ain't no, ain't no bad blood and then we just kind of moved on, moved forward. We got a little older. I would say like 19 and shit. We started putting our own money together, going to uh, Greenfield Plaza, DJ Brown at the time. He was recording us. He was one of the dopest engineers at the time with P's. He used to fuck with P's and all them niggas back in the day, Vezo. So we used to go to the Greenfield Plaza and record with him. And in the midst of us making our fourth tape as All Stars Ball Hard, everybody get locked up except me. Everybody catch cases and go to prison. T, J, R, Poe. So these niggas leave. Of course, we got guys that don't rap. That's ASBH. So me and the rest of them, I end up putting um, Get It Sold out by myself. So, uh, but it was a fun experience, you know. We had a uh, we had Dex on some shit um, back in the day called Numbers. He was just talking though. This before he blew up. This was probably like a year or two before he caught his wave. But uh, yeah, we had a few viral songs and shit back in the day. You know, we was we was making music for us. You know what I'm saying? At the end of the day, you know. Right. But our um, our hoods and shit was fucking with it. As far city. as uh, the group uh, assembly in the first place, how did you guys decide to become a group together? What made you guys stick together? So what it was was. You know, I've been on T Grizzly my whole life. You know, that's my family. Like my mom and his mama grew up together. So like my OG seen that nigga when he was a newborn and vice versa. So I met we found out we was real family in third grade. I went to school um on Joy Row. Joy Row like my second hood too. I was going to school back and forth to Joy Row, uh Dixon, that bitch knocked down now, but that's where I met T at. So ever since then, we was we really was beefing on some little elementary shit. You know what I'm saying? We first we started off getting into it with each other about to fight at the school type shit but then you know we got we got cool on some kids shit and then so i've been knowing bro my whole life and then i met poe and then when i was probably like 14 15 some shit i was in an alternative school i was homeschooled because i didn't like school at all so i was trying to do this homeschool shit and i met my nigga poe there through a mutual friend and he rapped i used to be seeing his shit on facebook like this nigga this the first nigga i met had his own studio in his granny basement like he been recording himself like i first met bro he was recording all his own shit fuck me up so when i met him and shit uh he stayed his granny stayed right around the corner from my granny so i used to go over there with him like damn bro you rapping i fuck with the rap shit too you know what i'm saying so he had heard one of my songs we used to upload shit on facebook like that, that was the way back then before we was uploading shit on YouTube. We used to rap some shit, put it on our Facebook pages. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So uh, when I met him, like I said, me and T was already like this. You know what I'm saying? So I told T, T started walking. This before we had cars and everything. T mobbing all the way from the other side of Joy Road all the way down to Telegraph. Because that's where our granny stayed at, Joy Road and Telegraph. Bro, in the trenches of Joy Road. We literally would stay on the phone and meet each other halfway like, Man, you got to meet this nigga Poe, bro. This nigga hard, man. T, like, I be rapping, too. I said, bitch, come on. we finna. <laughs> So after that, when niggas get to meet each other and see we all real street niggas, too, at the same time, like, outside of rap, we like, shit, let's form the group. You know what I'm saying? Why not? We started going to the studio and the shit. The rest was history. And think about all the times that a group of friends are like, yo, we should start this business idea or something together, and yeah. then it never fucking happens. Yeah, man, that's some bullshit. Niggas got to stand on their business around this motherfucker. Man. But you guys believed in it enough that it was like, no, we're actually going to do this shit, right? Oh, yeah, of course. I think it was just the background. I think we all was infatuated with the same shit. How I just told you, I came up five, six years old. I've been infatuated with this shit. I didn't watch cartoons, bro. I watched videos, bro, music videos, bro. That was my excitement at that young. And I think Brody and them had the same type of, and they, they OGs there around getting money, fly niggas. And, so we already 
that was already kind of like we shared that mutual feeling already you know what i'm saying right it's kind of like the lifestyle can contribute to the music right that's a fact and so people could look at that see the receipts and know what's real so it's even more of a motivating force yeah. um now continue from that point like you said you guys are working on these tapes together you're independent now mm -hmm. um what's the early uh, ride like for you guys being independent <sighs> Did you guys have money funded by music at that point, or were you guys just funding yourself at that we point? We was funding ourselves. We ain't no money off music, bro. We had just found out about Songcast. I found out about Songcast.com. When them niggas got locked up, that's where you distribute your music. That's the first shit we ever distributed our music from, Songcast.com. So your music is on the internet, and you're not collecting any money from the... Hell no. Nah. Damn. We was on YouTube getting views at the time. Shit, 80,000, 30,000, all that shit was big. We was getting them type of numbers on YouTube, though. Once we started uploading our shit on YouTube, we all buffed up. That was like our first big song as back then. Like, man, I'm talking about the whole shit. We had fans from Ohio, YouTube. They all, well, we in Ohio. We listen to this shit. And um, we weren't getting no money off no rap, though. We didn't even really believe that shit was really possible, to be honest. Because really? we felt like all the guys that was rapping from our city was in the streets getting money. They wasn't getting paid off no music. Yeah, that's an interesting discussion, right? It's like, how are a lot of these rappers funding themselves? And it's like something that a lot of people don't want to do to fund themselves, right? Yeah. So um, you guys don't believe it's a reality, but the music's slapping. You guys are getting plays from all over the place. Yeah. We're just talking about YouTube alone. We're not talking about other streaming platforms right, right, and ways right. for people to hear you guys. Mm -hmm. um, as a group is concerned, when was it where you realized, okay, now we're booking shows and shit's actually getting real now shit that i gotta get that to my street g niggas though like when we was with them we used to do a lot of strip club shows okay. just around the city shout out um free 80s free my nigga east side 80s i never forget we went to cobras we was hot as hell and 80s had like a host in our head i think he might have just been up there and he was like man i'm about to have y'all do a show up here come on they wouldn't even let us in we were so young but we used to do strip club shit though kod's crazy horses all that like we still got old footage with super ray back when we was 17 18 <laughs> and that motherfucker doing our thing so it's this shit documented bro side note super ray taking over the whole world right now yeah man. shout out to that guy's like two super million ray. followers and yeah, shit he going crazy generating crazy i'd be happy to see niggas still doing their thing man i've been in that shit as long as we've been in it who are the so. camera guys going on around that scene because tnb is still relevant right at that yeah. time super ray is relevant i think lace visuals is probably Mula, on. autumn that yeah. was i think T. I I want to say that that was Mula. I'm not sure. Don't quote yeah. me on that. But hell yeah, it's a few CT Films. Mm -hmm. That's my nigga. We shot our very first video with CT Films. Really? Shout out to Broski. Yeah. Yeah, because I noticed you work a lot with CT. Hell yeah, I shot a few videos back in the day with CT for sure. It could be argued that CT and Lace brought out the best visuals for like what Detroit artists wanted to be perceived yeah. as. Now shout out my nigga Lace too, my nigga Zay. Yeah, I, I got some shit with him too for sure. For sure. Um, so talk about that now. You guys are independent. Mm -hmm. You're not really making money off music, but when's the first moment? Is the Buff song the first time where you guys are actually realizing like, okay, there's money now, or is that just your first one of your first big breaks? Nah, it wasn't. Oh shit, we weren't getting no money still in off music, but it was. It showed us that we could do it though. Mm. Like. Bro, that bitch went nuts, bro. Like high school, up. Like, man, we still in high school. <laughs> this bitch all over the high schools, bro. I'm walking, I'm going to alternative schools. Niggas rapping my verse word for word. I'm feeling like a celebrity in that motherfucker. You know what I'm saying? So that we all buffed up shoulders, like nigga, keep going. We going on YouTube. We getting three, four, five thousand views in a day. Nigga, that shit is crazy back then. So we, I'm waking up, going to school, nigga. I'm looking at my phone, looking at the views. I'm like, bitch, we got 5,000 views on this bitch in a day. They like, hell yeah. So we just, we knew to keep going in. We knew, y'all. we always knew we had something special, though. I can't sit here and lie and act like we ain't know this shit was special. Like, we, even with Gris, like where he at right now. We always knew bro was special, you know what I'm saying? Of course we didn't, you don't know the future, bro. You know what I'm saying? But we knew, like, nigga, we keep going. The reactions we used to get from the OGs from our hood and shit, like, they was, man, y'all niggas rapping like y'all grown men. Like, y'all rapping like y'all. I mean, hey, bro, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. We so seeing this shit. You guys are hearing the response from not only the YouTube, but from the streets and yeah. from going out in public and figuring out you guys got something going on, right? Yeah. Um, as this continues, like you said, you're seeing something in T. You're seeing that he has something special. Uh -huh. um, did you guys have discussions in the studio mm -hmm. for how to create the songs, or was it just on the fly? Man, we used really, sometimes we used to call and have writing sessions, like, we started having writing sessions, like, towards the fourth tape, get it so, me, T, and JR, we used to be in traps, we used to be in the trenches, dog, we used to be, just to link up and write, you know what I'm saying? At first, though, we used to just, we always just write at the crib, I used to write in school, like, I wasn't never really in the school, but 
I used to sit down and write verses. They think I'm doing my work. I'm in that bitch writing a verse. You know what I'm saying? So by the time we get out of school, we go to the studio session. Man, I got my verse already. So we'll pull a beat up, bro. Got his verse. He got his verse. That's how we knew we was all serious. I don't got to ask you to write a verse. You already got shit written. So that go to show me that you on this shit like me when you by yourself or you just so infatuated. I'm going to sit here and write. If I go through something, if I see something that inspired me, I'm motivated. I got some money in my pocket. I'm finna write this shit. I'm about to rap this shit. You know what I'm saying? So, yeah. Uh, that was that was really our early like that was our early type of uh that was our early thing we did but probably like that fourth tape get it sold we used to meet up in, in a trap and write yeah we used to be man that shit was treacherous we used to be sleeping all just so we could be with each other you know what I'm saying yeah you know and that's uh if you read a lot of the YouTube comments talking about when you see you guys individually individually your song or T or Jr or anybody when mm -hmm. you read the comments it's almost like everybody's always like damn if they had just stuck together if they had yeah. just shit just worked out for and sure. it just shows like at that time you guys were all on the same fucking page right for sure, for sure. um talk about uh the con continuity of that when do you feel like um you guys felt as a group you guys were stamped in the city that we were stamped yeah um basically like i said of course we all buffed up but you know um we used to just do a lot like we was we was getting a lot of recognition early like like we go out motherfuckers would be like oh that's all star lee that's the sbh you know twitter back in the day when they used to have a twitter uh we used to hashtag sbh we had that bitch rocking we'd be trending on that bitch so we knew from people we ain't know and people we knew girls that we knew you know what I'm saying, fans. So we knew then, like, oh damn, we got some, bro. We somebody. You know what I'm saying. It must have been the hardest thing because I feel like the Doughboys, Cash Out, and Team Eastside era, and everything before that. Even like when you talk about Rock Bottom and Street Lords, facts. It was. It's not that it was small amounts of people be having a large amounts of success, right? Mm -hmm. And then the 2012 to 14 and 15 era, it's mm -hmm. like everybody unleashed. Everybody for some reason had more access to becoming a rapper or an artist at that yeah. time. So it's way more saturated. Mm -hmm. Most likely it's because of the fact that everything was cheaper. Like music videos are cheaper, beats oh, yeah, are cheaper. Sure, sure. Mm -hmm. uh, you could market yourself for free on social media and shit like that. Mm -hmm. Like Instagram was probably the biggest reason, right? Yeah. How were you guys figuring out how to separate yourself did you feel like a need to separate yourself at that time when all these other groups are emerging <laughs> at the same time? Man, we were just doing this, bro. Yeah. I think our street fame really like N not taken away from the music because we were some talented motherfuckers like still to this day so the music was that but at the same time you would catch us out though you would catch us at parties you would catch us in the strip club you would catch us in the trenches you would catch us doing whatever we rapping about so i want to say that that kind of helped a lot too because you know detroit a hard city man you couldn't be doing that you can be rapping that shit back in the day if you wouldn't like that at all like nigga, nigga gotta come know you oh he say he from where okay let's see what it's they checking they, they checking our backgrounds our dog really from over there with oh they from them boys don't play like they get money and they you know what i'm saying so i believe that helped us a lot because i want to say we wasn't even shooting a lot of videos back then you right. know what i'm saying so a lot of niggas got the advantage on us because they actually shot their visuals we used to just do the shit because we love to do it bro like right you know what i'm saying uh <laughs> As far as the, the group's um, continuing goes, what's the points where you guys are realizing, like, okay, there there might need to be some separation here, or that individually there can be more success? So Did really the separation came when, um, when T came on. He wanted to pursue his own solo career. Mm -hmm. um, so that's really where the separation came from, to be honest with you. But, you know, um, we supported that 100, 1,000 percent. I was with bro. You know what I'm saying? First day out, first blowing up, I'm traveling with him. I'm around him. You know what I'm saying? But yeah. T, T kind of navigated that. You know what I'm saying? Um, as far as his him getting locked up and everything, mm -hmm. is that a conversation in its own when it happened for you guys as a group? Like, all right, we're going to stick together. We're going to mm -hmm. figure this out. Like, what's the conversation as you guys are figuring out this is happening? Or you're not even thinking about this because this dude's about to go away. There's not even time to think about. Oh, you saying when he before he got locked yeah, up? Yeah, before he got locked up. Oh, no, time man, to that think shit about? was random as hell, man. That shit that happened with T-Man, because he was already fighting a case for uh, Lance, and he already spoke about it multiple times, but he was already fighting a case for Lance, and so the Kentucky shit happened out the blue. I ain't even, he called me and was telling me that they had to come up with this certain amount of money and shit the same day that the Kentucky shit happened. And next thing I know, the next day, bro, was calling me from the Kentucky jail facility. I was like, what the fuck you doing in Kentucky? Man, this shit all over the news, bro. I'm like, ah, oh, man, nigga crashed out. You know what I'm saying? I was hurt, man. You know what I'm saying? I, that's my brother. But we never really discussed going. We never discussed the group parting ways. It's kind of just happened. You know what I'm saying? 
But when we, you know what I'm saying, when we got together and we discussed it, it's still like we together. We still brothers, you know what I'm saying? But, you know, life go on. Niggas want to make their own moves. There's nothing wrong with that. You know I think, he, um, obviously, he's arguably one of the biggest artists to ever come from Detroit, obviously. For sure. I mean, that goes without saying. But sure, um, sure. at that time, you guys aren't on that level yet, right? Like, mm -hmm. you guys are still trying to blow up. And you know how it is now. If somebody gets locked up, it's free that person, free that person, all that. And yeah. in some ways, that can help promotion-wise. Mm -hmm. But in other ways, that person can't really do shit while they're inside. So it makes things difficult. Yeah. So did you guys strategically plan releases or anything while he was away knowing that he is away so we got to market a certain way or promote him a certain way or did it was it just all organic as far as like now nah, he's just locked up he's we could just free him that's it so the thing is like when i spoke about the get his soul shit i had to put that on on my own meaning them niggas was locked up poe jr t they was already in prison mm -hmm. so i was the only rapper that was out then i went through some shit where i got locked up but yeah. you know what i'm saying the grace of god i didn't get slammed it was only 72 hours and shit like that but what I was locked up for was something serious, so people didn't know if I was going to come back. You know what I'm saying? But um, I say that to say I kept it going when we was locked up. You know what I'm saying? I put out Get It Sold. Back in the day, Ball was like one of our biggest songs. It was T-Solo. See, we always knew bro was going to be the special one because I put Ball out. I uploaded it on our YouTube, and it went crazy through the city. So his his release was anticipated. You know what I'm saying? Then he had got on some shit with Peasy on Peasy first tape, too. So, you know what I'm saying? Like I said, I kept it alive like that. My first tape, Go Mode, I had bro face all on the cover of my shit. Like, niggas knew it. Niggas know I put this shit on my back at that time. And it was treacherous around that time because I ain't had no rappers with me. I had to do shit on my own, you know. So you're <laughs> operating this as everybody's away. You mm -hmm. have to make sure that it's the music career is still managed for everybody a part of it, right? For sure. Because somebody has to keep it alive. Hell yeah. I remember them niggas ain't even want me to drop that shit. I remember T and Jr. called me from jail. They was like, bro, we don't want to release that tape. Don't release that tape. I'm like, nigga, why the fuck won't we release the tape? We supposed to stop. This going to do better because y'all in there. Because we really didn't finish it. But we had enough songs to still release a whole tape. Why didn't they want to release it? I don't really remember what it was. I think because it wasn't finished. So okay. They felt like it wasn't no complete project. But, man, that bitch was hard. Still to this day, people love that tape, bro. Uh, what are the conversations like over the phone when you're talking to them, <clears throat> um, keeping the motivation going, and also just telling them, like, what's actually going on in the scene at the time? I mean, at the time, I wasn't even thinking straight. You know what I'm saying? When them niggas was in prison, nigga, I was going through it out here. You yeah. know what I'm saying? I was... It was treacherous for us. That was that was a significant. You time. had your own case going on simultaneously as this was you happening. Said case? Yeah. Like nah, hell no. Nah. I ain't had no case. Oh. I was on the internet for seventy two hours. Okay. So they can charge me with shit. Keep your mouth sealed. You go up. Okay, for sure, bro. Yeah, but yeah, okay. And I ain't no felon in none of that shit, bro. So I ain't. Oh yeah, no. Yeah, I'm saying like whatever that might have been for you to get locked away for seventy two hours. Like yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, when they heard about that, them niggas was hurt, man, because it was so much of a, it was it was serious. So they they didn't know what was going on. They just hearing through the grapevine, all oh, Lee locked up for this and this. Is music an implication? Do you think at all? Like mm -hmm. when the, when when there is an arrest happening, do you think they look at any of that shit, or was it just strictly just because of the actions that happened? Obviously, the story is out. The guys guy was robbing people, or whatever the situations might be. Mm -hmm. Like he even puts it out there. So. Um, but do you think the the music scene, the artistry, the way that stuff's posted on social media has any contribution to how like police officers handled all that shit? Hell yeah, nowadays for surely. Back yeah. then it wasn't that bad, but they was still watching. But nowadays, nigga, your ass, nigga, you you a goofball, you do some shit, upload some shit, think them people ain't watching you, especially if you rapping. They on rappers ass, you know what I'm saying? I had a time when Fresh Prince blew up, we was in the trenches, we was drinking and shit late night, being loud as hell. We see the police car rolling on the block. I'm like, oh, shit, police coming. Boom. They see who I am. They already listening to my shit, bro. For real? Hell yeah, dog. So they definitely, he told me they watch. They was like, man, don't put too many guns in the video, <laughs> man. You guys going to piss the feds off, man. Hey, since then, they ain't been a stick in my video. For real? You know what I'm saying? They, they tell, hell yeah, they watching, man. So niggas got to be careful with that shit. I don't, I'm about money anyway. I don't really post no sticks. You know um, what I'm saying? So you're trying to maintain everything. You're pretty much the manager at that point. Mm -hmm. You know, the group's away, and you're maintaining the everything from the outside. What's the city's response to this? Now, this is a group that's blowing up, that's yeah. on the verge. They're gone. For, oh, you got a few members that are away for that time. You have to manage everything. What's the city's energy like with you guys, and how did you maintain it? Um, they was fucking with that shit, man. Get it sold. Like, like I said, it was a classic in the city, bro. Even though we didn't even get the proper marketing, we never really got to shoot no videos off that motherfucker. I think we, me and Post shot a video off that bitch, if I'm not mistaken. I want to say Power Plays with CT. But they loved it, bro. Like, they loved that motherfucker. Like, the response was just like all the other tapes. They was rocking with us. Like, you know what I'm saying? The city always gave us great feedback, you know? Um, <laughs> Now, when T's getting out and JR getting out, 
is it a shocker for you that everybody's going to try to go their own way with everything? Like, how does that come to you? I know you and Jared didn't split immediately. I know no, that. no, no. Yeah. So, so the thing is, uh, like I said with T, it kind of just happened with him. Mm -hmm. I think it's because of his management and what he was dealing with that right. it kind of shifted him into his own thing. JR didn't leave. You know, we were still yeah. rocking. Me and JR was still going hard with the shit Poe. Poe had caught 10, so he was still locked up. Um, so, for the most part, like I said, we never really discussed going separate ways. It's kind of just some shit that happened. You know what I'm saying? And bro felt like that was a better thing for him to do. And then at the time, him and JR had a case together, so they couldn't be around each other no way. Right. Like, they couldn't make music. They couldn't pictures, none of that shit. Oh, so that's part of the stipulation when they were mm -hmm. out. They couldn't. Okay, that's Facts. crazy. So as far as you and uh, JR continuing together, mm -hmm. right? T's like, okay, I obviously know Joe Bino was, you know, a mastermind, so she probably had her own ideas of yeah, what's happening. Yeah, rest in peace, too. Yeah, rest in peace to Joe Bino, of course, man. If without her, I wouldn't even. Joe Bino was actually the one who gave me my first opportunity. That's because, dope. Yeah, she was in a room with me and a few guys, and she's like, "I want you to shoot videos with Sada," and I was That's like, dope. "All right, but so That's super dope. Uh, rest in peace to her." But at that time, she's taking him on his own trajectory. Mm -hmm. Halibut's a huge factor in contributing to Halibut and what direction to take him in. You and Jr. Are doing your own thing at that time. That dynamic duo. Um, how long do you feel like you guys were taking it before something just wasn't working anymore? Um, from like, I don't know, maybe from like twenty. 17 really from from 2014 all the way up into 2021 yeah. you know what i'm saying me and bro me and bro been put, we was putting it on and shit we was putting it together um we always putting on for this shit we uh we actually was having a tape right before we split ways we had a tape that we was working on together and shit okay so mm -hmm. um you guys obviously you guys were dominating together you know like drago and bino were one of the guys that really figured it all out for sure. right? and they became that dynamic duo that kind of took it out for detroit but people were figuring you guys like that there's so many comments when you guys were independent that if you look at the comments like damn bro uh where's lee at or damn bro where's jr at and that still to this day happens right yeah for sure um so for the for the fans did you ever give like uh a real response to them for it did you ever really put it out in the air like did you want to continue? Did it, what um, was your mindset I, for everything kind of separating? I addressed it a little bit. You know what I'm saying? I addressed it a little bit, but it's really just life shit, bro. You know what I'm saying? At the end of the day, you got males that, you know what I'm saying? This dude might want to go his way. This dude might want to go this way. You know what I'm saying? At the end of the day, it's shit deeper than music, bro. Like, they just see the walk in the booth and, you know, we have fun, but it's like, man, y'all got to really coexist with each other and, you know what I'm saying, make sure everybody on the same page to go crazy in the future with this shit. If not, then so be it, brother. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So at the end of the day, man, you know, life happens, brother. Yeah, for you know sure, man. Yeah, it's, uh, you know, it's more about the fans than anything else. Even look what, like, the situation with, I'm mean, not to say it's a situation, but 4 2 Doug has a concert, right? Mm. Doughboys cash out, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Team East Side, everybody's out there, and it's, like, a huge thing for the city. It's, like, humongous. Like, oh, my God, they're going to be on the same thing together. Yeah. It's, like, for the culture more than anything else. For sure. And I feel like the audience <laughs> looks at that the same way. Like, damn, All Star Ball Hard was, like, yeah. part of the culture. They were part of this group that's rising, and now it doesn't exist anymore. I mean, this shit gonna always exist as long as I'm alive. For sure. You know, I got this shit on my arms. But, you know, like I said, man, you never know. You can't predict the future, bro. Like, ain't no beef and no bad blood. Like, niggas ain't, you know what I'm saying? But Wasn't, wasn't there a point where 300, you were you were signed to 300? Exactly, yeah. And um, a lot of people looked at that as a positive and as a negative. Yeah. For some reasons, people thought that it wasn't the best decision to go with 300 and some people thought, mm -hmm. like, he did, this, he did the best he could with that situation. So, can you yeah. walk us through... The 300 um, entertainment I really situation. enjoyed the 300 situation Because mm -hmm. You know You gotta experience Certain shit to us That's like a nigga Going to the NBA bro That's like you hooping Your whole life And you don't really know If it's gonna work You done been one to give up A million times And you get drafted You know what I'm saying That's how that was But I also learned The business aspect of it too And I think that's the best Thing that I got out of there Was the knowledge Cause you can have the money And not have the knowledge mm -hmm. You need the knowledge Or you still gonna You know so I learned from the 300 situation, and a shout out to Celine, Kevin Lyles, and all them people, man. They good people, man. That was, that was a great milestone in my life for sure. What was happening uh, prior to you getting signed to them uh, or the deal coming together? What was happening for you prior that made them go like, you know what? Obviously, mm -hmm. T is a part of it and everything like that. So, what was it like? We're taking, we want to, we want you to be a part of this. Like, what was happening? I think they just did they research on me. You mm -hmm. know what I'm saying? They did a background check on me, like all my shit. Like I've been putting songs out. Since 2012, bro. Like, yeah. so I've been rapping and putting my own money up. Right before I got signed, I was spending thousands of dollars, bro, on music, bro. Had my own everything. Like, 
I didn't really need a label. I'm not going to sit here and say I was just super hot, but I was always still working, bro. You know what I'm saying? I was all, I was traveling on my own. I was shooting videos in Houston and Dallas and I had cameramen and producers and shit like that. So I think they seen that on, on, on top of, like you said, my brother T, you know, Ali Oopin' him. You know what I'm saying? And, I, and I've been around him a few times with Celine back in 2017, 2016. So. That's always the conversation that people have when uh, one member of a group takes off and succeeds and then they never look back to help the people that were around them when they mm-hmm. were going coming up. Um, and your story is kind of contradicts that, right? Like for people who think that's not real, it does happen, right? Like yeah, for sure. T was like, yo, if he didn't co-sign or say yes, mm-hmm. then who knows if that would have happened with right. them, right? Mm-hmm. Um, talk about that journey though and talk about why people might perceive it as a positive and a negative for your career. I don't know why the fuck they <laughs> perceive it as a negative. Mm. As a, that's on them, you know, at the end of the day, man, people have all type of speculations and shit like that, but mm. you know, that's just what come with it, bro. Well, talk about the positive ends from it. Obviously, you're learning game, you're learning from CEOs, you're learning from people who accomplished so much in the yeah. industry. Just to be on a platform, you gotta understand, bro, I was on a label with Gunna, Megan the Style, and yeah, Thug, you know, T, you know, a few other people. So it was a dream come true because I, I used to see 300 and Kevin Lyles and them in the hood coming up, watching shit on music. So it was definitely a dream come true, bro. But I needed that to learn the business because at the time I didn't know shit about the business. I didn't know, you know what I'm saying? But it was a learning experience and I really appreciate that moment, bro. Like it really didn't, I wouldn't say it changed my life though because I was already living like a rap star before that. Before I got the check from them, I was already rapping and traveling. But it, it definitely taught me the business and marketing and how important having a team and structure is. Because, you know, a lot of the times there'd be a lot of structure behind this shit. And if you don't know no better, you think it's just the artist. Yeah. It's way um, more than that. When people are seeing that there is a little bit of tension within the group, mm-hmm. um, and obviously we don't have to get anywhere near uh, into it as far as comfortable as you are with getting into it, but obviously there's a lot of tension within the group, mm-hmm. uh, original group members. It's mm-hmm. all over YouTube. People are talking about it. You and JR aren't seeing eye to eye. And then yeah. there's a situation with T. It's a triangle effect of nobody seeing eye to eye. Yeah. Where did that all stem from? Where was the miscommunication so, starting from? So what you see what you see on YouTube? Well, I mean, from I try to be careful when I talk about stuff like this because you know, I really try to be careful, but I'm gonna be very surface level because a lot of people yeah. don't like to have their names mentioned unless Oh no, for sure. You, know yeah, what I'm you ain't really gotta mention no names or nothing. Um but obviously just within the group that there's like diss tracks being flown around and then yeah. and then there's people that aren't um you know, a group kind of having tension from within. Yeah. See, my thing, bro, I don't know nothing about no motherfucking diss tracks. Like, okay. I ain't never diss none of them niggas on those songs. Like, okay. We don't do that. And if it is a diss track, to my knowledge, I wouldn't know anything about it. You know what I'm saying? Okay. We ain't on no... I know where I can speak for myself personally. I'm not on no diss song, nothing. You know what I'm saying? Like, I'm on some get my money, rap my life. Why, is you, why does YouTube have something like that up there, though? Clickbait. Is that, it's just clickbait bullshit? You know how this shit go? Come on, kid. Okay, so <laughs> so the diss track that is on the internet that people are trying to promote mm-hmm. as a diss towards Tigris. I haven't even seen it. What What is it? Who? Do you want me to pull it up real quick? I or, mean, do what you want to do. What was saying, man? Because I'm confused. I just want to see it. Oh, yeah, yeah, for sure, for sure, for sure. I don't know. Yeah. I'm going to see. I'm going to keep it gangster with you, too. Motherfuckers make it push. Motherfuckers pull shit out there. An all star lead does T Grizzly for leaving them behind. Absolutely false. This is six years ago. <laughs> it's only a minute long, so I guess we can just play it on here. But it's in the lab, man. It's probably just straight cap, right? Yeah, absolutely. Let's just see what this is all about. Here. <laughs> all right. You like a stranger. So, look, before you go any further, right? We have to separate this songs. And the truth, the truth cannot be. Now, a nigga might take it disrespectful. Like, if you on there like, bitch ass, hoe ass, pussy ass, nigga, fuck you, nigga. That's disrespect, but the truth can never be disrespect. I was just speaking my truth. Right, so you felt- Nobody felt like that was a diss. Uh, whoever that is on YouTube may have felt like that, but the people I know that wasn't no diss. That was venting. I was venting. Uh, yeah, I mean, nobody in the- all, The only comment that really gets an expansion about it is damn sad you had to diss- him though t grizzly everybody can't come up at the same time because it would not be right mm. that's like the only response that i seen that was like yeah. a legitimate like come back to it but you're basically saying it was a truth it wasn't a diss it was, it was the more- truth. my brother ain't he feel like it was no diss 
Mm. You know what I'm saying? He ain't feel like that. You know, I was speaking my truth. I was speaking how I felt from the heart. Right. Which is what that's what music is. That's what that song was really about. You know what I'm saying? At so people took that out of context and was like, yo, that's a diss when it's more so just like, no, this is just how I'm, I'm feeling. Speaking at the my moment. truth, brother. Yeah. Like now as far as dog, I can't really speak on what he you know what I'm saying? That's yeah. how he feel about it. But I wouldn't even take his shit as a diss. You know what I'm saying? It's just how niggas felt at the time. Diss right. songs is you know what a diss song is. Tupac hit him up. You know, that that's dissing like that ain't that's not a diss, man. Yeah, for sure. Okay, so it's just yeah. mis- misconstrued and everything like that. No, nah, people um, do, bro. So the conversation. So just to clear the air for yourself right now, that mm. everything within the group isn't what it's portrayed to be on the internet. I mean, of course, you see niggas ain't like, like I said, T Grizzly. That's my brother from another man. We mm. Really got the same mama, damn near. Campaign, loving the death. That's my brother. With Jr. Of course, you don't see us together. That is what it is. You know what I'm saying? Like it's, I wouldn't say it's no beef, but niggas ain't got no relationship. Niggas ain't rocking with each other. That's just what that is. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. You know, niggas love me. You know what I'm saying? I love who love me. You know what I'm saying? Right on. So okay, so I, I get what you're saying. Um, the, nobody's coming on here saying that there's anything more than what the internet's putting out there. The internet nah, can nah, just nah, do nah. whatever the fuck they want to do. You know how this shit go, man. Believe Everybody me. wants a reason, obviously, but it's like there is nothing behind it. So it's almost like believe none of what you see on social yeah. media. Right. Um. As far as you continuing from that point, though, when there is all this stuff happening on social media and the mm-hmm. internet, how are you handling it within that people are misinterpreting things? Like, how did you guys handle it as a, as a you know, Oh, friends? like all the controversy and shit. Yeah, like, how did saying? you guys handle that? Did you guys communicate with each other about it? Man, not paying no attention to that shit. For sure. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, it have been, been personal talks because we are brothers, but that's for us to know. That's our business, you know what I'm saying? But cool. like I said, it's never been no nothing on no street shit or nothing like that but at the end of the day man niggas gonna go their own way around this business niggas, niggas grown men bro you know what i'm saying with responsibilities we wake up trying to get money every day and get rich and stay rich yeah and some people know like what's working for them might not work for somebody else or exactly that's bringing the whole everybody thing up at it. the same time might not work or whatever mm. um individually you continue to make your own music you continue to drop you got decent reciprocation i feel like you are a little bit under acknowledged as far as yeah how how crazy the views were versus now mm-hmm. but i also do i do read comments all the time i've been following you for a long time and only oh, comment that's dope i only see people's comments as like fire fire go mm-hmm. og but i also see the comment inconsistent like if you just drop more it should be crazy yeah and that's why i said and that's the key point of me saying when niggas say that i'm underrated and shit they feel like that i don't because i know i've been inconsistent you know what i'm saying right. i'm not about to sit up here like i said and be like oh they ain't giving me my motherfucking props with a rant you ain't never seen me rant on instagram and say man y'all dick sucking ass nigga soon as i get on nigga y'all bet not nigga i ain't never did that you know why because i understand the situations like bro i go through real life shit and like i said i just now learned the business you see what i'm saying i just now learned the business maybe a year ago bro so when i'm rapping i don't know shit so when the inconsistency is coming from me not having the right structure behind me bro so if i got to where people support me and I got fans without structure, what you think gonna happen when the actual structure come, bro? Right. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. So, you know, the underrated comment be cool and shit like that. And, um, you know, shout out to the people that feel like that, though, because they support me. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. I appreciate it. Yeah, inconsistency, like, it's it's crazy. I, I've seen so many, thousands and thousands of artists in my time of being around the industry, and I always notice that the most talented artists are often the most inconsistent. Mm. And it's just like a curse, basically. <laughs> you know, it's like they have it all, they have the whole package, yeah. but then, like, real life comes in the way, or maybe they're not motivated for whatever reason mm-hmm. possible. But mm-hmm. now is that time, right? Like, now you really want to hop back in oh, that bag sure. and, and push forward. So what's been the strategy as of now? What's been, like, the blueprint for you? Man, this year going to be big, bro, like... <sighs> You know, my nigga Poe, I got to keep speaking on bro because he a big part of me, period. Like, he just came home. He motivated as ever. I'm learning the business more because, like, everything that I do, I want to do it in a big aspect. I want to do it in a, in a, you know, and you have to know the business in order to do that. Yeah. So I had to sit back. Part of me being inconsistent was me sitting back learning, like, going to school to learn this shit. So when I do hop back in it, I'm going to get the results that everybody feel like I, that I should have. You see what I'm saying? Partner yeah. up with certain people and, you know, get this shit on the road. But this year going to be big, though, bro. Like, like I got a tape on the way, man. I got a, I got a, I got a music video actually dropping this week. I done dropped two songs this year. A little system, this run special. Y'all can go stream them on all streaming platforms. But, like, yeah, bro, like, I got over probably two, three hundred unreleased songs, bro. 
You know what I'm saying? So like a nigga been working, y'all just might not see it because I want to make sure that I put it out the proper way this time. Right. That's all it is. Like a nigga ain't never stopped working, bro. Like, you know what I'm saying? I love music. I would be doing this shit if I wasn't getting paid. So yeah, when you already have the foundation built, then it's time to bring out the polished stuff. Right? For sure. Everybody already knows what you got going on, but mm -hmm. you got to take it to the mainstream level. I don't. I think if you stay in the underground scene when you're meant for the mainstream, it causes your career to go backwards always. Yeah, for sure. So, yeah, it's it's all big shit, man. Like nigga, we, you know, what I'm saying I don't really like to do nothing small, no how. So yeah, I'm really I'm on a, I'm on the road to that big shit. You know what I'm saying? Just you, step by step though, the shit, this shit a process. You know now what I'm you've you've experienced the underground and the mainstream. Mm -hmm. Uh, just for tidbits for people watching that are artists. What's the difference? What are you noticing that underground artists can do to kind of shift towards the mainstream? And should they shift towards the mainstream, or should you just take whatever niche you have or whatever audience you have? If you're hood famous, go with that. Yeah, I mean, it all depends on what you want out this shit. You know what I'm saying? Some people want to hit the mainstream. Some people cool with just making 15, 20k a month off distro kid. They don't give a fuck if you don't know them or not. They paying their bills. They can do this and do that. So it's all about what you want in this shit. You know what I'm saying? At the end of the day, you just gotta be yourself. And if you got a crowd of people that fuck with you, keep catering to them. And if you want to take the shit to extreme, it's gonna take you know it's gonna take some shit though. You know what I'm saying? If you ever took a second to look back at your audience and the type of dem type of demographic that was rocking with you, what were you noticing as far as similarities? Did you notice which audience or which area was fucking with you the most? Man, that shit crazy, bro. You wanna know why? Cause I just looked at my motherfucking um, Apple Music for artists, bro. I'm getting streamed in North Northern Europe, bro. Finland or some shit <laughs> So you don't know What the fuck Until you start Actually traveling And going to these places You would never really know But for the most part though man Man I had fans from You know Cali, Ohio Motherfucking Canada bro I, done, I performed in Canada In 2018 bro <clears throat> I got booked out there You know what I'm saying So You know my fan base Just fuck with me bro Like I, I Like my little sister had uh, a few years back when she graduated from, um, you know, she had a middle school graduation, bro. They was lined up. I was signing autographs, bro. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, so I've experienced, you know, different things with my with my audience. It's been from little kids to older people, to grown people, to older ladies. And so, you, you know, it, it's a variety of people, bro. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, for sure. And it's easy in Detroit. It's kind of easy to... Uh, place yourself in which Detroiters are messing with your music because you know there was like the scam rap scene at one point sure. street rap at one point get money payroll Giovanni type music type for shit like sure. that mm -hmm. uh, so it's kind of interesting how many different divisions there are for what people can pick up from Detroit music yeah. um, <clears throat> as far as the scene's concerned now are you paying attention to the scene are you paying of attention course. to the upcoming artists and everything like that of course the ones that I run across for sure what are you seeing from the sound? Is it transforming to you? Is it getting tighter? Is it getting, like, what direction do you see it going? To be honest, I love the sound right now. You know, of course, it, the industry, they love our sound right now. You know what I'm saying? Um, I feel like it, it, it definitely evolved, and it kind of changed a little bit different. And the reason I say that, because, like, with Doughboys, it was kind of more of an up-tempo sound. Then it kind of got down when my when my nigga Ro and all them came out. It slowed down, you know, like that face type of music, that V's type of shit. It's kind of like a little slower tempo, which is hard. Vezo, all that shit hard, you know what I'm saying? But to me, it's two types of different Detroit. You got our up-tempo sound, and you got our, our, our slow down, kind of like grimy, you know what I'm saying? So I like both, bro, you know what I'm saying? For the most part, I love where this shit at right now. It's the it's better than it's ever been. If a nigga tell you it ain't he cap, bro, <laughs> like this shit is where it's at right now. Yeah, I'm sure. I mean, I've been in Miami and shit. They, man, you from Detroit? Oh man, I love y'all. You know what I'm saying? Like, I'm hearing, I'm on motherfucking, um, I'm in Miami and shit, on the beach, dog, and they, I'm hearing motherfuckers ride, they playing on Detroit shit. Now that you're kind of uh, pressing, I know you only have two songs out right now from this year, 2024. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, it sounds like you got a little bit of a blueprint ready to go. Oh yeah, for sure. Or have you contacted any artists to like collaborate or do anything with yet? Gotta stay tuned, man. But sure. I fuck with everybody in the city. Like before niggas blew up, like majority everybody that you know what I'm saying, the people look at like celebrities and shit from the city. We done we bumped into each other back in the day and they they was fans of my music back when we was ASBH. So it's a it's a love, you know, it's a love there. So whoever I really wanna work with, I can work with, you know what I'm saying? So it's definitely coming though. You definitely gonna hear the city colliding, man, and we we definitely I got some shit with uh with my nigga Keith, big Keith from Dope Boys. Of course I got shit with T. I just did some shit with uh, Big Homie. Shout out to my nigga Big Homie and them. Um, but 
but it's a few more though. Y'all gonna see though. It's gonna it's gonna be legendary though for the most part. Cool. So uh, do you have you don't have a tape uh, name for a tape or a date uh, release or anything? Again? I'm gonna call it PSA Platinum Service Announcement. Cool. Yeah. For sure. Uh, is there anything you want to talk about before we chime out? Um, I just want to tell everybody to stay tuned, man. You know, we gonna have a big year. You know, what I'm saying my brother's coming home. Free snow. He'll be home next month. Free Liberace. He'll be home next month. Baby Grizz will be home. We're going to keep that under wraps, though. But he coming he coming real soon, man. And we're going to get back to really, you know what I'm saying, coming to, well, me personally, I'm coming to get what I deserve, what people feel I deserve. You know, I'm going to put my, put my all into this shit. I'm going to get great music, bro. This is some of the hardest shit I've ever heard, bro. Like, everybody they hear, like, because the difference is, nah, I'm making more music for the people instead of me. Like, back in the day, I was just making this shit for me and my niggas, like, people i was around my hood other hoods so now i'm giving the people what they want to hear still being me at the same time though so um so talk about the stinking lincoln and drinking video and how that all came together man me and my mans was in the motherfucking car having a conversation bro probably was talking about some wild shit you know we some off the wall niggas i just grabbed my phone out man these hoes ain't doing nothing but drinking lincoln and stinking bitch do something else better with your life oh fuck you that's how i felt at the time you know what i'm saying man that bitch went so nuts man that bitch had like four million views on the real side yeah two three hundred comments celebrities everybody was sharing it but you know they can relate to that because a lot of these hoes do be funky bro you know what i'm saying <laughs> So at the end of the day, bro, I just gave them the game. They ain't doing nothing but Lincoln drinking and stinging. So the world related to that shit, man. And that's just me being me. They don't know I really be, you know, I'm a silly nigga sometimes. So. Yeah, I mean, Jack Funny came out with this funny-ass skit. Do you fuck with Jack Funny? Yeah, hell yeah. Shout out he to came out with this funny-ass skit where he's dancing by his friends. And it's like when the one friend that smells uh, is <laughs> fucking dancing. And it's like the funniest skit. But how many comments there was was like... I was thinking to myself, is, like, are, is that many people not smelling right out here? Like, Man, what's going on out here? Some of them hoes that was reposting my shit be stinking. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It got to the point where, bitch, I'm t- really talking about you. You know what I'm saying? Not yeah, like, me. I hope you see this because the song was literally made. Well, these four million views, were, it all started because yeah. I thought about you in the beginning. No, for sure, man. It was some silly shit. But like I said, man, you know. I tell it like it is, bro. You know what I'm saying? I just give them me. That was raw. Like I said, that wasn't planned or nothing. We just in there talking, feeling good. Probably done made a lot of money that day. Man, man these hoes ain't doing nothing but drinking, leaking, and stinking. You know what I'm saying? That was just that simple, though. But that bitch went super nuts, though, for sure. Are you a fan of, like, the uh, the like the like um, kind of culture of the women in Michigan and, and specifics? Like, do you appreciate the ladies in michigan yeah ladies i'm not gonna oh, say no, detroit because sure. i'm gonna get in trouble if i say detroit but let's <laughs> talk about michigan as a whole like i the only thing i noticed was like everybody's on social media like women are on social media too much and not only that mm-hmm. i think everybody got fascinated with the fact that they learned how to put on makeup and dress right and i'm like damn like that's not <laughs> just because you just figured this out doesn't mean you got to post it every five seconds you just figured out how to do makeup and get go to Le- uh, lululemon like all right relax like we understand there's women that dress just like that look just like that that don't post on social media every day man for real them the real baddies right there man the girls they got got uh they got five pictures on they shit no i'm talking about the women that aren't even on instagram son exactly you, it, man you, go. you got some girls that don't even you see them in person, it's like, yeah, this this that real platinum shit right here. You know what I'm saying? You damn near I, marry a girl that's not on Instagram right now. I'm just, I'm just gonna marry you just for it. I don't give a fuck. Yeah, for sure. She is strong minded person. She ain't going off the wave of what's going on and what's trendy in the world. She got her own mind. Cause a lot of people, they minds come from off social media. Like this ain't even what you feel. You seen somebody else say it and you psyched your mind out to feel <laughs> like that that's not even you. Yeah. Like, you know, so you know. You get motivational speeches every time you open up your phone, and it's from a motherfucker that's not doing shit. Like, why am motherfucker I motherfucker telling you some shit? Don't be like this, and they like that. <laughs> that's when I knew social media was crazy. Oh God! No, there was, there was this. Uh, they're promoting like this podcast tour where they teach you how to podcast, mm-hmm. and I went and watched their podcast. They averaged like five views. I'm like, why the fuck would anybody come learn how to market a podcast from you when you can't even figure out how to market your own damn podcast? <laughs> And yeah. it's like that's just how everything works these days though. Like everybody takes a concept and tries to monetize the fuck mm. out of it when they don't even got anything they're talking about. You think social if you let's just say you became a multi millionaire mm-hmm. rapper, mm-hmm. would you log off Instagram forever? If you didn't need to use that shit, would you would you stay off or would you be on from back time to time? Man, that shit's so addictive, bro. I ain't gonna even sit here and cap, bro. I didn't try to delete instagram with my phone i'm keep getting on the phone trying to find instagram that bitch gone i said man let me just re-download the fucking app yeah. the shit 
shit entertaining, bro. You know what I'm saying? But I, I just feel like if it wasn't Instagram, I'd still be lit though. Cause you would catch me outside. We'd be more. You, you, you could see this shit. We ain't no Instagram niggas. Y'all could come outside and see this shit. You know what I'm saying? So it's like, yeah. if if it wasn't social media, I'd still be who I am. I think social media just made everything better. You got, you know, you got the good and the bad with it. It's like anything else, bro. It's pros and cons. But for the most part, niggas making a bag off this shit too now. You know what I'm saying? So millions of dollars for sure. Launching careers, right? Yeah. Um, is there anything you want to talk about before we sign off, or anything you want to promote? Man, PSA coming soon, man. Um, go go stream All Star Lee. All my shit that I just dropped, System PSA, all that shit. You know what I'm saying? And just so. stay tuned, man. We gonna rock out. We gonna go platinum around. Shout out the chain too, goddamn. Oh yeah, of course, man. You it's know fire. That. Real diamonds, man. Not no laboratories, man. <laughs> Unique. Yeah, somebody came on my podcast talking about Molson Night and all that shit. Yeah. And people were messaging to me. To each like, his own. I ain't knocking no niggas. Do what you want to do, man. But People were DMing me like, like, yo, like take that. that down. He's fucking up the game. I'm like, oh. oh. <laughs> it's you lost like when, big times. It's kind of see when you, uh, those massage parlors, when somebody goes like, oh, this bitch was trying to give me a hand job. And everybody's like, stop blowing the spot, man. Let us have this. Like, all right. Freaky ass niggas. <laughs> Listen, man, blowing blowing up the, the massage parlors fucked up, though, man. Man, they crazy. If man. it wasn't for some of these massage parlors, there'd be wicked men out here. That shit crazy, There's nowhere else to go. I don't know, man. Niggas, you know, that's on them, That's bro. like totally on a, it's in a world you don't even understand that world. Yeah, yeah, all right. Yeah. <laughs> Yo, give me you a bad bitch to do that for me. I, ain't, I don't need no massage parlor to do it. Yeah, I feel it. You know how that uh, I'll start Lee, man. Appreciate you being a part of this. I oh, love, bro. Look forward to seeing what comes of this, man. Um, like I said, always great energy, man. First time I met you, great energy. Now it's great energy. And I feel like what you're going to bring out to the music scene in Detroit is going to be significant. Like, you got the bass and everything now, and all, all everybody ever wanted was consistency. So I think that's all it is. I got some shit coming this week. Stay tuned. Parallel Sound Studio hosts these productions where uh, High Low Visual shoots them. We're out.